Well, welcome everybody. Glad you're here tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll see some more people roll in here in a few minutes. That's kind of how it works around here, isn't it? <laughs> all right. It's all right. I'll go ahead and open us in prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, we're so gratefully grateful, Lord, uh, that you got us all here safely, Lord. It's a great opportunity, Lord, to learn more about your word. And we're uh, very excited about uh, the lesson we've got coming up. And we just know that uh, every bit of it is important for us. And we're just thankful again that you, that you used uh, great men uh, throughout the ages to document what you want us to do to, to follow you in the right way. And uh, you've made it easy for us, Lord, to, to, to know your will and to follow it. And we just ask you to be with us tonight and be with those that are still on their way. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, tonight's lesson is uh, entitled, How to Hear from God. Uh, it'll be on page 20 of your booklet. Um, it starts out, uh, first thing I want to do is give you a little disclaimer. That a lot of the verses that you're going to see in this lesson plan are either NIV or New King James. They're kind of a mixture of both. So if it doesn't look exactly like your Bible, check the other version. Um, it starts out on page one uh, with a verse that says, uh, uh, John 10, 27, and it says, My sheep hear my voice and know them, and, they, and I know them, and they follow me. Uh, who can tell me what's the real key words in that verse? Who are the, what are the key words in that verse? What's the important distinction? Well, I would say my sheep. Right, because this applies to a specific set of people, those that are saved, those that know him, um, those that have a personal relationship with him. Uh, so majority of this lesson applies to those that already know Christ, that are, that are attempting to follow him the best they can. Uh, however, we do know that the word does draw man to God, and that, uh, as in Romans 10, 17, it says, so then, so then, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we do know the word of God is important even for the unbeliever. But the lesson tonight is mostly directed toward believers. Okay? Um, I would say you have to be a believer to get the full benefit of what's described in this lesson tonight. Uh, in the overview, it says the word communication is defined as to impart knowledge of, make known, when God communicates with us, he is imparting knowledge and revelation about himself to us. The most important truth God wants to communicate to us is he wants us to know him personally. Jesus said in John 17, 3, And this is eternal life, that they may know you. So your fill in there is know. The only true God and, G and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Okay? So again, your fill in there is know. And then the next paragraph says the most effective way to communicate is to have a face-to-face -face dialogue. That might be the only fill-ins that you'll have that you can't really get directly from the scripture. Um, would you agree that a face-to-face -face conversation is probably the most effective way to communicate with someone? Okay. Uh, this is how God communicated with Adam and Eve prior to them sinning against him. Sin became the barrier that prevented them from being able to have face-to-face -face dialogue with God. As in Isaiah, Isaiah, um, Isaiah 59, 1 through, 1 through 2. Verse 2 tells us, in, this, in, that, in that set of scriptures, so Isaiah, uh, Isaiah verse 59, verse 2, tells us that God's face will be hidden from his people because of their iniquities. Now, who can tell me what the word iniquities means? Sin, right? Uh, the definition of iniquities is immoral or grossly unfair behavior. In simpler terms, it's sin, right? All right. So throughout the Bible, we read about God speaking to people like Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, and David. A great example of this is found in Exodus 33:11, where the Scripture says, "So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend." And now we have a question here. It says, does God still speak to people today as he did with the people during biblical times? 
All right. Now, the short answer is yes. In this study, we will discover the ways God speaks to us, how to recognize His voice, and the importance of responding to His voice. All right. We're still on the probably close to the end of page 20, and then we go into a section that says, How did God speak in the Old Testament? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Okay, so your first two fill ins is various times, your next two fill ins is various ways, and spoke to the fathers by the prophets as your. Is your next fill in. That's Hebrews 1, verse 1. All right. All right. Now, starting on page 21, we, have, we go into what says God's main way of speaking to people in the Old Testament times was through prophets. Peter says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.21. A prophet is someone who is moved by the Holy Spirit to communicate God's message to the world. Prophecy can be communicated either orally through men such as God, Elijah, and Nathan, or through writing such as Isaiah, Daniel, Isaiah, Daniel, and Jeremiah. Isaiah. I'm going to get that right. I don't know why I'm having a brain lock with Isaiah. Okay, it's Isaiah. There we go. All right. So uh, bullet one, it says, he spoke audibly. Who is he? God. God spoke audibly. All right. All right. In bullet A, 1A, it says, he spoke to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. In verse uh, Numbers 12, 4, it says, come out, to, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So, so this section, we're talking about how God speaks, spoke to certain people audibly. All right, where they could f physically hear him. All right, and uh, I don't know how I got. I got. I don't know how I end up with two A's. You have two A's. <laughs> okay, so we got one A and one A A. All right, he spoke to young Samuel while he was lying down. In other words, Samuel was in bed. All right. Now, if you look at the scriptures, you'll find these answers for yourself. So. Uh, for those who can't make it to tonight, you could uh, pick up this study. You could actually fill these in quite easily yourself by simply reading through the verses, and you'll find the, the missing words. Um, so it is designed to be a self-study as well. All right, now B, it says, He spoke to the Israelites, and they were terrified. Deuteronomy 4, 9 through 13. Now note in, in, in uh, verse 11, it says, Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the midst of heaven, with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. Okay. So all these scriptures we're reading, of course, are examples of God speaking audibly to people. And... Um, wouldn't that be kind of frightening to hear that kind of powerful voice coming out? And we'll, we'll get into that a little more in a minute. In uh, bullet C, it says, Peter, James, and John heard God's voice on the Mount of Transfiguration. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, Matthew 17, 1 through 6. The Bible does not make it clear which mountain this transfiguration event occurred on. However, Matthew 17 does tell us that Jesus was transfigured as the, three, as the three disciples watched, Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And in verse 3 it says, And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Verse 5, we skipped four there. Verse 5 says, Behold, and a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Okay, so the transfiguration is is the um, the event where his he just his face shone and his clothes shone bright as the sun. Uh, it was a clear, it was a, a clear indication of his deity on earth, right? And only his, only these three disciples were the witnesses. P 
Peter, James, and John. All right. Now, here's a note that says, God speaking audibly was the exception, not the norm. It appears that the voice of God is so powerful and overwhelming that he chose other means and methods to communicate with us. All right, so here's some examples, some further examples, I believe, of, of the power of his voice. In Deuteronomy 4.33, it says, Moses asked the people of Israel, Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and lived? He was attempting, or Moses was attempting, to reassure the people that they were God's chosen people and as such were expected to honor God in a special way. All right. So, so that question was directed to the Israelites. Um, God didn't speak to other people like that, typically. Um, I'm sure there might be some examples. Um, Exodus 20, 19. Uh, then they said to Moses, <clears throat> excuse me, then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak to us lest we die. So that experience was quite traumatic for the Israelites. They didn't, they didn't really care for it. It was very, very powerful. It was, it's kind of, I guess it'd be like, uh, you know, it just kind of went right through their bones. It was so powerful. It wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant experience, apparently. In the previous verses of Exodus 20, the Lord God had spoken about, uh, uh, out verbally to the people the Ten Commandments. So during this, during this time when he was speaking, he actually spoke out the Ten Commandments verbally to the Israelites and to Moses. The power in his voice really frightened the people. Now consider electricity. High voltage power lines can be as high as 765 volts. When we think about the average house tap here is 120 volts, 765,000 volts. It's pretty powerful. If we plug our electrical appliances into it, they would be fried. So in order to be able to use the power, it must first be reduced to 120 volts by a transformer. And then, of course, before you plug your phone into it, now it's going down to 5 volts, right? Further reduced. In the same way, in order to reduce the, power, uh, the powerful voice of God, he uses transformers or other methods to communicate to us. Now, here's an example. Speaking to a child using small words, right? Yeah. You don't want to use big college-grade vocabulary when you're talking to a child, right? You've got to tone it down. You've got to make it down to their level. Um, and so, so God has other ways to get, get his points across to us, to teach us, and to guide us without scaring us half to death. <laughs> All right. The possible reason God's voice seems terrifying is because of our sinful condition. God is holy, and we, when we who are sinful stand before him, we feel condemned when he speaks to us. Let's look at some of the various methods God spoke to people in the past. All right? Okay, so this is a, a different method of speaking rather than audibly. So we're in bullet two, and we should be pretty somewhere on page 22 there on your guide. And it says, He spoke through various methods. Uh, Letter A says Jacob, otherwise known as Israel, was, spoke, was spoken to in visions in Genesis 46, 2. So when you read that verse, it'll speak about him as Israel because God's using his name as Israel, the name he changed his name to, rather than Jacob. Okay. And B, it says Abimelech. Um, and Abimelech was a king of Gerar, and he spoke to Abimelech in a dream in Genesis 23. He spoke to Moses by, who can tell me? Of course it's written there, right? A burning bush. That one's pretty easy, right? Exodus 3.2. Isaiah by a heavenly vision. Isaiah 6, 6 through 6, 7. Uh, bullet E says the prophet Hosea. Uh, yours just says Hosea, but I wanted to add to the fact that he was a prophet by his family crisis. 
Hosea 1, verse 2. Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he put, he put Isaiah, uh, Hosea in a kind of a tough spot. He, I guess he wanted him to be able to speak to the people from experience. Um, so he actually went and he married a, a woman named Gomer. And she had quite a few children, and there was, there was a, a little turmoil in the family at times. But he was an effective prophet because he did what God told him to. All right. Letter F says, Amos, by a basket of summer fruit. Amos 8.1. All right. And G says, Balaam threw a donkey. Y'all are probably familiar with that story. Numbers 22.28. And then through nature, this is letter H, the heavens and the firmament are mentioned in the scriptures there. So that's Psalm 19.1. Right. So if you read these scriptures, a lot of them will be kind of, kind of percolate back down to a vision of some sort. Um, maybe through a dream while sleeping, uh, maybe while you know, straight up awake. They see visions, um, but, but God did choose many different methods to communicate to, to his people. And most of these people, um, I won't say most because uh, Balaam was not necessarily a follower of Christ, yet he heard, from, from through, he heard God's words directly through a, don through a donkey. Um, I don't think Abimelech was definitely a follower of Christ, but yet he was, or a follower of God, but he was being used by God, right? Um, the problem with all of the other mediums is what he is trying to communicate can sometimes be confusing or can cause misunderstanding. For example, email and text. Anybody ever sent an email that was misunderstood? <laughs> all right. Uh, what happens when, you, uh, when you're misunderstood? Huh? What kind of problems develop when, when your communication is misunderstood? It, 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 it could, uh, could lead to bad things, right? Uh, so these mediums can communicate truth, but because you cannot see facial expressions, you cannot hear the tone of the voice or see body language, the heart of what is being communicated can easily be misunderstood. Because of these limitations, God implemented a plan to restore the face-to-face -face communication with us. Redeem us and restore us through His Son. Okay? All right. All right, now, Section 3 starts out, saying, it should be on page 23, and it says, How does God speak in the New Testament? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past by the, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. Actually, 2a. Right. So the two fill-ins is by Son. So by his Son. All right. Bullet 1 says God speaks by the Son. The Word of God. Right? The entirety of what God wants to communicate to us can be summed up in what he communicated by his son, that God loves you very, very, very much and was willing to die in order to have a relationship with you. The message of the son is redemption and restoration for mankind. When Peter, James, and John were on the mountain with Jesus, the father said in Luke 9, 35, this is my beloved son, Hear him. Okay. All right. In letter B, it says, read John 17. Uh, added a little uh, information here. It says, main goal of his mission, um, to know God, to give revelation about who he is. In verse 3a, <coughs> and, this is an, and this is eternal life that they may know you. All right. And then um, everything that God communicates to us will, will be to get, to us, get us to know him. Know his love, grace, mercy, and generosity. 
All right. Letter C, John 1, 1 and 2, and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, everybody catch their fill-ins on that? Okay. That's a very, very well-known verse, right? Uh, John's gospel starts out with a very powerful message that God was with us at all time, you know, from the beginning, that, that the Word is Jesus. So we're talking about the way that, that, that God communicates to us through Jesus. It's because the Word we're reading, every jot and tittle of His Bible, is Christ Himself. He is the Word. That's literal, right? That sounds like it might be, uh, what's the word when you're not literal? It's uh, figurative, right? That's not figurative, it's literal. Okay? All right, the Word of God is the primary way God speaks to us today. There are ten ways God speaks to us. Two of those are primary, and eight of those are secondary. Okay? Obviously, primary being the most important. Secondary being, you know, add add-ons to the to the most important. All right, all right. So the, number one in the primary is scripture. The most important thing for communication with God is the Bible. Right. So in letter A, it says Second Peter one sixteen through twenty one. Um, and for for your information, we're only reading verse twenty one out of that out of that message. And for Verse 21 says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Letter B is 1 Thessalonians 2.13, and it says, We also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Okay? So I think that's, I think that's, you know, it's quite clear that it's, um, it's being pointed out quite directly that um, it's not the word of men, but it is the word of God, right? Even though it was written by men, right? So bullet two, Bible teaching. <clears throat> we uh, should be on page 24 at this point. Oh, excuse me. What are some examples of Bible teaching? A sermon given by our pastor or an elder would be an example, right? Uh, maybe Bible study like we're doing tonight would be a form of Bible teaching. Um, what would be the, another very important form of Bible teaching? Anybody have a good one? Personal Bible study, right? Where you yourself dwell, delve into the Word, hopefully with the support of the Holy Spirit, and you learn and you and you teach yourself. All right. All right. We'll get into some ways to make sure you're teaching yourself correctly in a little in a little bit. All right. Verse A, uh, bullet A, Second Timothy three sixteen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, or God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The comma at the end of the verse 16 indicates that the thought being conveyed is not yet complete. Right? So I'm going to read the next verse that follows it. Verse 17, it says, it goes on to say, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay? So those two verses really need to go together. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God or God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right? All right. And we're still on page 24. We're going into this, uh, one of these. Uh, we'll start in with the secondary methods. Um, of hearing, hearing from God. 
Important notes, these secondary methods should almost always be confirmed by a primary method, right? And will never contradict the scriptures. Okay, so the prim one of the, the first primary method was scriptures, right? So we want to remember that as we go through all these secondary methods that if you, if um, some of these secondary methods could seem, could be a little more complicated, right? They could be a little harder to understand or digest. So you always want to compare what you think it means back to scripture, right? And then we'll get into some more methods to find out how to make sure you're on the right track. Okay. All right. Does it contradict the Bible or what I have been taught about God's word or what you have been taught about God's word? Allow, okay. Now let's look at example one down here. It's called inward, still, small voice. Um, if you have an inward voice telling you that uh, when the guy cuts you off in the middle of traffic that I should sh shoot him the bird and, and make some obscene gestures or whatever, do you, do you think, if we compare that to Scripture, are we going to be able to say that that's biblical? <laughs> we should be able to tell right away that that's not what God wants us to do, right? So that's just a very obvious example of how we can go back to Scripture to make sure we're on the right track. All right, so... There is a verse prior to these uh, bullets that says Matthew 18, 16. Every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, I was looking for a reason for that scripture to be in this particular position. And so I came up, personally, I came up and I said, I believe this verse is given here to say that we can confirm any of these secondary methods by consulting with other mature believers and to get consensus on their interpretation, right? As an example, bullet five, if you go down there, bullet five says, sound counsel. So I kind of think that's what these verses are trying to tell us as far as relation to the subject matter here. All right, All right so if we start with bullet one, inward or still small voice. An example of that can be found in Acts 8.29, uh, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Okay? And in bullet B, you have an example in 1 Kings 19, 11 through 12. Uh, did we, can we have somebody pull that up? I should have given you a little advance notice. Could you read it? Okay, so if you really study this verse, it's talking about uh, a point in time when um, Elijah was going through a difficult period. Uh, the people didn't believe him. They actually were out to kill him. Uh, he still wanted to follow God. He knew God was speaking to him directly. He knew that he needed to continue his mission, but he was very, he was in a bad, he was uh, depressed. He was scared. So, so God showed him, first of all, he showed some power that he had. But it's important to note that the verse, verses tell us that he was not in them. So Elijah is really not directly communicating with God through these, through these um, awesome displays of power. But at the end, God came to him in a still, small voice. And that was, the, that was the reassuring part for Elijah. That's where, and in this still small voice, God tells Elijah, I want you to pick up your things, and I've got, you, I've got a mission for you. He gives him another mission to go to and gets him started on something important that he wanted done. And it helped Elijah because now he has a purpose. He has something to take his mind off of all the other things. And so it was very beneficial for him. Okay, now if you look at bullet two, peace of God, 
uh, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. All right. All right. So another form is circumstantial. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 2, 12-13, Paul had an opportunity to preach in Troas, but, was, but because he did not find Titus there, he departed to Macedonia. These verses say that Paul had no rest in his spirit because he did not find his, Titus his brother. Um, I think, I'm not positive, I, I kind of got stuck on this verse for a while, and I was trying to determine is this you know, his second missionary journey, his third, I think, I think, I'm pretty sure we're talking about his second missionary journey here. Uh, because on his second missionary journey, he did meet up with Titus. Um, but somehow they must have gotten separated before he got as far as Targus. Um, I printed these, I printed these, and you can pass these around if you like. These are all three of his missionary journeys. Pretty interesting. Um, I printed this map because it shows some of the areas that are um, mentioned in the Bible but don't show up on the other maps. And then this is just the mis second missionary journey. So that's discussed more in Acts 16, I believe. All right, so... Okay. All right, and, and number four says burden of the Lord. Romans 9, 2 through 3 uh, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. Okay? So this is Paul speaking, and Paul has a, I mean, a serious burden for the Jewish people. Right? His main mission in life, as God gave him, was to preach to the Gentiles. But at the same time, he never forgot about his brothers, the Jews, who most of which um, kind of went against the gospel, didn't believe the gospel, weren't followers of Christ. And he had such a severe or such a, an intense um, sorrow and anguish in his heart that he would be willing to lose Christ himself if he could make sure that all his other brothers found Christ. Now that's a man of God right there now. That's somebody that, because he knows what the circumstances, he knows what the consequences of not knowing God are. And that is a man with a, with a gracious heart. All right, so bullet B, we have Romans 10, 1, and it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Okay. All right, and here we are in uh, bullet five, uh, sound counsel. This again, if any of these other things fail you, seek sound counsel. Seek your pastor. Seek an elder. Find someone that you trust, that you believe, understands the point you're trying to get, you know, get down hard. And, and don't stop with one. Go to, go to couple and make sure that they, they agree with each other, right? It's important that we have it right. Right? So in Proverbs 12, 15, it says, The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 19, 20, it says, Listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end you will be wise. Proverbs 24, 6, For waging war, you need guidance, and for victory, many advisors. Okay? We're, God doesn't expect us to, to do this by ourselves. All right. He sends the Holy Spirit as our primary counselor, but sometimes we may have a hard time hearing the Holy Spirit. Maybe we need a little more direct input from someone we trust. All right. Again, when you get that direct input, what are we doing? We compare it back to Scripture. Are they telling me what the Scripture says? Right. So always go back as your, your final check. All right, number six, we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, we have prophecy as one of the gifts, word of knowledge, and word of wisdom. Now, in addition to these three gifts, the verses also list faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Now, number seven, open and closed doors. Revelation 3, 7 through 8. He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Okay. I believe we must be talking about Christ there, right? In Acts 16, through, uh, chapter 16, verses 6 through 8. Closed doors in Asia and direct gospel to Europe. Hmm. All right. So I did, I did give you the maps there. Uh, in that verse, it talks about how they were going through Asia. They hit some of the cities and the maps that are highlighted there. Not cities, but regions. Uh, like, what is it, Mitra, Galatia. Uh, I, can't I can't remember the names of them, but I did highlight them on the maps. Um, and at one point, when they got to a certain point, God felt uh, he had a vision, which uh, was from a man in Macedonia that said, you need to come minister to us, which is part of Europe, right? So you're leaving Asia to go to Europe if he goes to Macedonia. So they never made it up into the last section that he had intended to go in Asia. So a door was closed. He, he felt that the door was closed. He felt a calling to go elsewhere. He left Asia and went to Europe. Right, basically into Greece, uh, Macedonia. All right, and uh, bullet eight, it says, Visions and dreams, Acts 2, 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Okay? So God communicates today in modern times through visions and dreams. Bullet B, Acts 16, 9 through 10. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right. So I guess... Part of what this is telling us is to be flexible. Don't, don't be so intent on your mission that you forget to listen to God as he might be redirecting you. Right? Okay. Now bullet four, or uh, section four, are you listening? It should be somewhere on page 25 at this point. It is important that when God speaks, we are tuning in. Here are some practical ways you can prepare yourself to hear God's voice. All right. Number one, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46, 10. It is important that you schedule a time when you can unplug from your normal routines in order to spend time with God. Bullet B, Mark 1, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Who are we talking about in that verse? Jesus. Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus set the example of early morning prayer and study and being solitary, getting alone. Um, in bullet C, have a devotional time, a personal worship service. All right, bullet two uh, lists prayer. Or pray. Um, bullet A, 2A says Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavenly laden, and I will give you rest. All right. Bullet B said it's having have an open conversation with God about what's going on in your life. Ask Him to lead and direct you concerning the things that are on your heart. All right, so now we're going to page 26, and we have bullet three, read the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17. Obviously, we covered that earlier. Verse 4, or bullet 4, respond. Obedience is an important component in hearing from God. All right, bullet A, 1 Samuel 5.22, to obey is better than sacrifice. Responding to God's will can often be hard since we may need to deny our own will, right? This is something I added to the, to the commentary here. When our, when our, especially when our will conflicts with God's will, correct? Um, our own will can sometimes be much louder in our brains and get most of our attention if we are not focused on God's will. Uh, does anyone else here have a problem with that? Because <laughs> I know I do. I get pretty much pretty easy for me to figure out what I want to do. But do I always stop and consult God to see if that's what he wants me to do? That's a hard part. That's the hard part. All right. All right. Number five, wait upon him. Isaiah 30, 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. See also Isaiah 40, 31. And I went ahead and uh, broke down Isaiah 40. 40:31 it says but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint All right so there's a lot of advantages to waiting on the Lord All right now bullet a it says there are times when God will speak to you right away However, there are other times when he may not give you an answer right away, right? So, again, that requires waiting. All right. All right, so we're now at the end of the study. We're on page 26, and we have homework. We have Matthew 26, 40. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? And in verse 41, it says, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay? So the homework is to set aside one hour this week to spend time with God. All right? So in that verse, it underlines Christ was very disappointed in those disciples that they couldn't, they couldn't stay awake for one hour. Um, so he... He would be disappointed in us if we can't do the same. All right. That's our lesson. Right. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? All right. So keep your books, and we'll have another lesson next week. Next week, I guess. Next Friday. All right. All right. I guess I'll go ahead and close this. All right. All right. Heavenly Father, again, we're thankful for the opportunity to come and learn more about your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for um, being with me as I prepared for the lesson. And just uh, I, I hope that I imparted what you would want, us be, want me to impart. And we're just, I'm just grateful for your Holy Spirit. And I'm grateful for your word, Lord. I pray that you be with those that are here tonight and keep, get them home safely. And, uh, and, and show them something in the Word this week. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.